Welcome to Solutions for Higher Education, a podcast by Scott L. Wyatt, President of Southern Utah University in Cedar City, Utah. To subscribe to this podcast, please visit www.suu.edu forward slash President's Podcast, where you will find both the audio and a written transcript for today's podcast. Hi again, everyone, and welcome to Solutions for Higher Education, a podcast featuring Scott L. Wyatt, the president of Southern Utah University in Cedar City, Utah. I'm your host, Steve Meredith, and joining me today, as he always does in studio, is our president, Scott Wyatt. Hi, Scott. Hello, Steve. Glad to be here. And uh, it's nice that the weather is starting to warm up a little bit. That's right. It's, yeah. it's springtime outside our windows. We've had a pretty snowy, uh, cold winter so far, and so it is nice to feel a little bit of warmth in the air. And today is a particularly interesting and maybe important to you and I. I don't know if it's important to our listeners, but today is our 50th podcast. This is uh, We're going to take a few moments to recognize uh, some of the greatest hits of our first 50 podcasts. Yeah, this has been uh, this has been a fun run so far and I can't wait to have the 500th anniversary. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you and I will what? be talking like this. <laughs> yeah. It's so good to see you again. Anyway, um I uh, uh I thought that it would be appropriate um to go back to some of our earliest podcasts and you actually chose a favorite from podcast number one, our very first podcast, which um, even our most devoted listener probably will not remember, but but it was something that was on both of our minds at the time, and it was college and university rankings. Right. So it it seems like the... those that involve themselves in ranking colleges and universities tend to do the rankings based on things that are easy to collect, not based on those more difficult things, the outcomes. Right. And the outcomes that we're talking about are, for example, what condition do we find a student on day one freshman year? And then what condition do we send them out at the end of their senior year? Right. The distance traveled. Yeah. What is the value gained? And yeah. and the rankings typically rank based on the quality of the student on day one. That, that's actually kind of an overstatement. But you can sort of say that because they're saying, you know, things like how exclusive are you and how much... Um, how big is your endowment and all those kind of things, which... What percentage do you turn away? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the more you turn away, the better a school you are. When in truth, the more you accept and the greater value you give to them, the better the school you ought to be. Right. So here's a little snippet from our very first podcast that I think we were recording in your office, actually, um, before we moved to our luxurious... <laughs> Uh, I, I wish you you could see the place where we actually do our podcast. It's in a bedroom of an old mid-century house, but uh, uh, but it's quieter and, and nicer. But our first podcasts we did out of your office, yep. and this is podcast number one, College and University Rankings. What are the criteria that are being used to evaluate us? And if you look carefully, what you see is, is that U.S. News is ranking the universities based on things like reputation, faculty resources, student selectivity, alumni giving, endowment size. Have you heard anything yet that suggests whether students are learning? No, it sounds like it's uh, a measurement of how elite the institution is or how, how many resources it has. Yeah, it's, it's about potential, but it's not about actual. And so we're judging all of these universities and publishing these rankings based on our potential to do good, perhaps, but not on whether we're doing any good, whether we're changing any student's lives, whether we're helping a student learn, uh, become a more creative thinker, to be more prepared for the democracy that she or he is um, going to be a part of, 
whether, whether the students can get a job. None of these things are in the rankings. So um, why is it that, that we care so much about student selectivity? That, you know, that's really great. You've turned a lot of students away, so you must be terrific. But um, is anybody actually learning? It seems like to me that the measure of learning would be to take, uh, to take an average student and have them turn out to be outstanding rather than to take an already outstanding student and, uh, and graduate them, right? I mean, doesn't that seem to make sense? Well, that was, uh, that was an interesting little bit there. I, I still feel really strongly about um, the things that we were talking about with, with college rankings. Um, it, it, I feel as passionate about that today as I did the day that we started with that. So do I. And we all in our lives tend to do things according to how we are measured. That's right. You know, I mean, we, well, if you're going to measure this, then I'm going to do it. If you don't measure this, I'm not going to do it. Is it going to be on the test? The famous. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Is it going to be on the test? If it's not on the test, I'm not going to read it. And if we could just find a way to do rankings in, in the, in a more enlightened way. Right we would all find ourselves motivated to behave differently. Anyway, there you go. We're trying our hardest, aren't we? We are. So an interesting project that I've been involved in, as well as you, of course, it was your great idea, and I've I've just really been involved in the nuts and bolts of it. But um, we have recently... uh, (laughs) I was just involved in the nuts and bolts of it. Is that what you said? Yeah. (laughs) Just? Well, you know, (laughs) there are lots of nuts and bolts. (laughs) Every... (laughs) <laughs> every every great idea is like one percent, and the nuts and bolts are kind of like ninety nine percent. Well, uh, <laughs> the, 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 yes, there were lots of nuts and bolts with this. <laughs> there but, were, there but were a lot of nuts and bolts. <laughs> we're talking about uh, our and, and some of them were big big nuts and bolts. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's right. We're talking about our dual enrollment agreement with Southwest Tech. Um, Southwest Technical College is a sister institution here in Cedar City, just a few blocks away from our campus. And it occurred to you and President Brennan Wood, who is the president of Southwest Tech, that it was silly that we were not more connected in more substantial ways, being um, being in a small town together uh, and being two reasonably small, comparatively, institutions in our own, uh, in our own particular areas, that it seemed like we could do more if we were connected than we could do separately. And so that led you and President Wood to to this idea of dual enrollment. Why don't you talk a little bit about that for a sec? Well, the the idea is, I think the idea begins with we are taxpayers first. And um, we should always think, what's the best use of our resources and how do we serve the general good and the public? I think that's where everything should start. It's easy to forget that because we get caught up in our worlds and we, we forget that we're citizens of this country first, not leaders first. Right, right. And we're students before we were um, faculty or administrators. And so we, if we can just focus on those kinds of ideas that what's the most efficient, what's the best thing for the community – then everything starts becoming more obvious. But but this one, particularly interesting, because now that we've done it, um, we think it might actually have been the first time anybody in the entire history of our country has done this. <laughs> yeah, it's it's pretty unusual. <laughs> we're we're coming to find out. Yeah, I the speaking of the nuts and bolts, I think probably the most interesting part of this to me was trying to get people to see the difference between what we do in terms of time-based education and what Southwest Tech does in terms of competency-based education. And that that may have been the single biggest stumbling block was was converting one to the other, if that's the the way to say it. We we haven't really changed. They, They continue to do what they do, and we continue to do what we do. But we worked out a way... um, in nine really comprehensive articulation agreements to calculate more or less in real time simultaneously what a student was doing at Southwest Tech and grant them credit 
over at SUU for that. And and as you suggest, that's that's fairly unusual. Um, we haven't we, <laughs> we haven't been able to find a lot of people who are doing that simultaneously. Uh, there are there are lots of examples of transfer programs, but but the, the fact yeah. that that students are really are students uh, at both places the minute that they enroll in one, they they're a, a student that's accepted for credit at the other. So. Well, and from start to finish, um, from conception to absolute completion and full validation from our creditors, uh, just under a year. Yeah, it's uh, that in and of itself is is remarkable, Steve. Yeah, well, and uh, and you led that. You're you're giving me some more credit for that, <laughs> I think, than I deserve. But I yes. Well, and compounding all this, of course, is the. You talked about the culture of time-based and competency-based education. And, and we also have this other piece, which is um, a somewhat selective admission regional university that says to a non-credit granting technical school. That's primarily career and technical education, uh-huh. right? We value you equally to us. And we think that we both have... Um, contributions to the community that that um, need to be seen as being equal partners right and um, that that is that that's been some of the fun part of this well here's a little bit of our uh, interview with Brennan Wood this is from season one episode number 18 and if you're wanting to go back and listen to any of these older episodes you keep in track at home and want to hear one that you missed this is our interview with President Brennan Wood of Southwest Tech. But we have one thing in common, and that is that we're six blocks from each other. <laughs> we're in the same relatively small zip code. community, same zip code. <laughs> uh, we have completely different governing structures. We report up through different governing bodies. But we've decided that we're going to try to find a way to... Um, without changing governance, without changing our institutions, um, finding a way to get married. So those who register at Southwest Tech are entitled to register for classes at Southern Utah University. And those that are going to be admitted and enrolled at Southern Utah University can sign up for classes at Southwest Tech. And we each will give our rec- our own separate credit to the other. That's the that's the mission that we're on. And pretty simple, don't you think, Brennan? I think it's <laughs> simple, but if you really think about it, how how awesome is it? Well, first of all, a community of this size has a university and a tech college. That is that is amazing. You don't find that very often anywhere else in the country. So to to take the two entities and to then, as you said, a marriage, a partnership that creates positive outcomes for the residents of this area is a great thing. And, and why haven't we done it in the past? Well, that, that could be a long discussion. But it's today we're doing it, and, and the future is bright for both the university and the college. I'm really looking forward to this taking place with I, we should tell our listeners that as we are recording this, we are looking forward to fall of 2019 when when this kicks in uh, fully, this Southwest Tech dual enrollment thing. We're expecting uh, several hundred new students that, uh, that aren't actually physically on the campus but are SUU students to begin to accrue credit. In various uh, in various areas, and we're really excited about it. I, um, I I can tell you that I spend a fair amount of my day and week answering questions about it. And the minute that we that we actually went public with it, once it was fully accredited, um, we we have begun to there, there's a quite a lot of interest in this amongst our uh, local students and even uh, even outside of our local service area. Yeah, time will tell how successful this is, and the the more we see students taking advantage of it in the community and then and then we've had some discussion you know from schools in other parts of the country so we'll see 
we'll see what happens over time. Yeah, this is I, this is though I think one of our uh, happiest accomplishments, don't you think? I do, and and um, I I should say publicly I appreciate the opportunity to to head that up <laughs> to to handle the nuts and bolts. So, President, one of the reasons that I love working with you, and you've been you and I have been working together for, gosh, since two thousand. Six, is that right? Something like that, 2007? 2007. Seven, yeah. Yep. So 12 years. One of the reasons that I really enjoy working with you is that you are a creative thinker. Uh, you are also an analytical thinker, as most attorneys are, but you, uh, you have great ideas. And I think one of the great ideas that you had for our podcast was the idea of a summer book club. Um, it You are... An, uh, maybe people that know you know this, but but for some of our listeners that don't personally know you, you are a voracious reader, and uh, uh, you don't spend a lot of time on social media. You do spend some, but but you're. I think it's not stretched to say that um, when left to your own devices, one of your favorite things to do is to read a book. If you're not going on a long hike, you're probably That's reading right. a book. It's always a question of am I going to read something or. Am I going to feed my mind or my body right. today or this afternoon or this next 10 minutes? But but book clubs are things that are fairly common. It was I think that there's a lot of people that do them and not terribly unique for us. But but we decided to try it and we it did. was fun. Yeah, it was. Yeah. You chose, you chose a book um, uh, called The Ghost Map, which was about a cholera outbreak in London and... And really, the first the, the um, this is public health epidemiology um, yeah, it's, it's, successes. Yeah, it's kind of the story of the birth of public health, right. um, and and it's when they figured out what was the cause of cholera. Um, it and, was it wasn't miasma. the The idea of fouled air. The yeah. Cholera is not an, an airborne illness. So it's it's a story that has a lot of drama. And there's a lot hanging in the balance. So if you want to read a terrific mystery novel, this is the right one. Because when you're done, it's just not that the you know that the hero got the bad guy. It's the, something really happened here. Saved this is this is a really cool story. Yeah. yeah, and it's um, but but what I love about the story mostly, Steve, is that the story is a great reminder that the smartest people in the world can be dead wrong. And that we have to always question our assumptions. We have to always um, be open to new ideas. And we can never really just sit around and think we got it all figured out. And and this has an impact on the way I view my job and the way I view my life and everything else. That even though all the smart people agree we might be wrong. That's right. And my asthma was wrong. Yeah. And the smartest people in the smartest city in the world were all wrong. So this is our episode uh, 27 from season one. We were interviewing Dr. David Blodgett from the uh, Utah Department of Health. He's the head of the Department of Health in this part of the state. Yeah. And, uh, and, he, t- and he took, so we, we were talking about the book, but then he gave a little vocal example. Right. <laughs> and talked about um, what happened in court in Iron County. This is a great story. A long okay. time ago. So this is this is Dave Blodgett <laughs> giving uh, recounting testimony that was given in Iron County Court. <laughs> the Iron County Court. Iron County Court. So there's two characters involved here. Dr. George Middleton. He's the city physician and health officer, as well as the mayor. And uh, Judge Herbert Adams. So let me let me there, let me just read this to you, <laughs> and then maybe have a note. So Herbert Adams was appointed Justice of the Peace in the Cedar Precinct, and, fo- and the following is one of Justice Adams' notable cases: Doctor George Middleton, city physician, instituted proceedings against certain sheep men who ranged the, their herds in Coal Creek Canyon that were polluting the city's water supply. So all of the water was taken out of Coal Creek at that time. The whole case rested upon the germ theory of sanitary pollution, and the doctor's expert evidence was wholly on this point. 
Suddenly, Ju Ju Judge Adams broke in with a question. Judge, Doc, what is a germ? Doctor, germs are minute living organisms of animal or insect life of microscopic size. Judge, Doctor, have you ever seen a germ with your own eyes? <laughs> <laughs> Um, yes, through a, mi through a microscope, I have, doc says the doctor. Judge, why haven't you put some of those animals here before the court as an exhibit in this case? Doctor, your honor, judge, they are too small to be seen with the naked eye, and the court has no microscope. If your honor desires, I can bring my microscope and slides from my office. Judge, you mean, doc, that you can't see, th you can't, they can't be seen by the naked eye or with common reading glasses? Doctor, yes, your honor, they are too small for that. Judge. Anything that is too small to be seen by the naked eye is too small for this court to waste its time on. Doc, <laughs> you show me a germ and I will eat it. Case dismissed. That makes me laugh every time I listen to it. Um, it's uh, <laughs> at the, you know, put the germs right here where I can see them or else I'm not going <laughs> to. Yeah, it's hard to embrace new ideas. It it's really is. To, it's hard to let go of things that we've been in. I, my, uh, my mother grew up in a little farming community just over the border in Idaho. And um, the saying was during the winter, because it was a dirt road all the way to town, and it was a long dirt road to town. And they were, it was a very poor, poor community. But the saying was, pick your rut because you're going to be in it all the way to Preston. <laughs> Because you can't get out of it. That's right. It is so hard. It is so hard for us to get out of ruts. Yep. No, that's right. So I don't think it's any stretch to say, President, that one of the biggest, um, certainly national news stories on college campuses has been freedom of speech and the idea that um, that campuses should have enforceable speech codes that uh, would allow certain ideas to go um, uh, to be suppressed or or not allowed to be said is a, an ongoing issue um, we see we see uh, people being i think they call it deplatformed or not being allowed to speak uh, on certain issues at college campuses and uh, as an attorney and also as a uh, history buff uh, particularly interested in the founding of our country. You you actually have had some ideas about this, and we've actually had two different podcasts about this. Yeah, we get we get caught up in trying to make the world a better place and forget the foundation for how we got to be and will continue to be a great place. Right. We forget that that democracy is designed to make the world better, but democracy is totally a dependent on us allowing risk that we have to let people say things that are offensive and um, and if we don't do that then we find ourselves outside of a democracy we find ourselves in increasingly becoming more like a totalitarian regime and um, the worst dictator in the world is the dictator of the masses, not the dictator of one. Right. Because if we're if we're pursuing our own agenda, we we can say, well, it's just not me. There's it, it's everyone feels this way, but a dictator of one knows that she or he is responsible. So th so the dictator of the masses is the worst, and the only way to protect us against tyranny is to allow speech, both protest and ideas. And if government gets to regulate all the ideas that are spoken, then we're in trouble. You you have and often I, said, we work for the executive branch. Do you really want us to put to be in charge of, of what you can say? Yeah, yeah. Do you, do you really want us to be in charge? And um, the answer is, well, yes. If you're going to enforce the speech that I want, right? And no, if it's not, but. We always have to remember that the best defense of our own liberties is to defend others in theirs. And also that if we are right, and we know we are right in our ideas, then we would never, ever 
feel like we have to stifle somebody that disagrees with us because we know we're right and we know that in the end we'll win. Right. So anyway, that's the amendment number one. The yep. foundation of this government is free speech. And on college campuses today, it's not always obvious that we're pursuing those same values. So we're going to listen to just a little snippet of uh, an episode from season two, episode number 39. This is Jeff Landward, who is... Um, He's legal counsel for the Utah system of higher education and, and an expert on free speech. That's um, right. I, and, and that's, I think, why people have so much trouble understanding why hate speech would be protected under the First Amendment because of that association, because they associate hate with violence. They assume that the speech is violent, but it's not. In most cases, hate speech is an expression of an idea, an expression of a viewpoint. And you have to remember that even decades ago, uh, a lot of what we consider now to be hate speech was acceptable. And over time, it has been viewed as, as less and less acceptable now, ugly and abhorrent. But the thing, the, the distinguishing factor is that when we're talking about hate speech, we're talking about a speech that's been categorized, but really it's not a category. It's just the expression of a viewpoint and an idea. And that's why it's so difficult to try and regulate hate speech because you're ultimately regulating a viewpoint and regulating an idea, and that's notoriously hard. In fact, sometimes it has unintended consequences. In, in, in the civil rights era, uh, many schools enacted speech codes on their campuses that prohibited hate speech with the intent of protecting their minority students, protecting their African-American students, for example. But what they found was that most of the complaints being filed with the school for violations of that code was coming from white students complaining about speech coming from African-American students who were protesting racism. And so it really got turned on its head, and it just exemplifies why it's so difficult and dangerous for the government to be put in the role of determining what is and what is not hate speech. And because really, it's just giving the government the authority to say one viewpoint is okay and one viewpoint is not, and that's the opposite of what the First Amendment was intended to do. I've always found this particular um, idea of hate speech to be interesting, and, and Jeff's thoughts on that are particularly interesting, I think, um, that, you know, if, if we have, um, we, there are groups of people who think that hate speech is unprotected speech when in fact it, it clearly isn't except in some very, very narrow exceptions. Yeah. Very narrow. <clears throat> and it's because who do you want to define hate speech? The Republicans when they're in power or the Democrats when they're in power? Or some other party when they're in power? Right. Who do you want to define this, anyway? I'm in favor of the Whigs. A <laughs> <laughs> comeback of the Bull Moose Party. You want the Know Nothing Party to <clears throat> yeah, define it? that's right. That's right. <laughs> so, President, heading back toward our first season, um, one of the things that, that we tried to focus on early on was the questions that people have about higher education. Um, what is its real value? And I, I, I think actually um, that's a, it, it's fair to say that that's a question that we get asked a lot. We get it asked by taxpayers. We get asked by the legislature. Um, sometimes we get asked politely, other times <laughs> less. So, um, uh, you know, are you doing what you're supposed to be doing? Are you, are you good servants of the people? Um, are you uh, taking care of the money that we give you and so forth? And, and one of the things that we wanted to talk about very early on was the return on investment that a college degree actually is. There, there is a great deal of discussion around that right now, and neither you nor I, I think, would 
say that every single person in the United States should go to the college or university. But I also do think that probably you and I would say that almost every person that we can imagine can have their life enhanced by some sort of training beyond high school. It's one of the reasons that we that we engaged with Southwest Technical College. It's one of the reasons that we um, that we continue to do what we do is that we see the value uh, and and not just the value personally and and uh, emotionally and philosophically strengthening people, but but the real financial value to a college education or at least some education beyond high school. Yeah, the the return on investment. What am I gonna? What am I getting back financially from what I'm spending? And um, the return on investment is very positive and, and is still very positive. And it's going to continue to be more positive. And we haven't, Steve, we haven't done a very good job in the higher education community of um, responding to the, the various criticisms that are waged against higher ed. And, and, um, and we, I guess this podcast was an attempt to try to really explore this and think about it a little bit. So we did, uh, mostly you did, a fairly deep dive on what the return on investment can be for a university student seven years beyond their graduation date, I think, is was the parameter. Is that correct? Right. And uh, so this is this is... Our discussion from Season 1, Episode 3, The Return on Investment. But if you look at those that have a bachelor's degree or higher, there has been an increase in 8.6 million jobs. There there are 8.6 million jobs more available in America today for college graduates than there was in 2008. There actually wasn't a loss of jobs during the recession for college graduates. Um, and there's been a boom of jobs in the recovery. So there's a lot more opportunities. The next question might be, yeah, but how much money can I make? And uh, the data there is really clear as well. The difference between the lifetime wages of a college and high school graduate is a million bucks. So if you choose to just graduate from high school and go to work, you'll make a certain amount of money. And on average, if you choose to go to college, you're going to make a million dollars more. That's a lot of money over a lifetime. And, and interestingly enough, it's not just a college degree because the difference between the highest and lowest paying majors is about $3.4 million. So while the average earnings of a college graduate is a million more than high school, you can really bump that up even more. Um, if you choose to have a major that's going to lead you to one of these higher paying jobs. So there was never a time, even during the worst of the recession, that there were fewer jobs available for college graduates. And in the recovery, it's been no contest in terms of the number of jobs available for college graduates versus non-college graduates. That's right. If you look at the, the start of the recession to the point at which we say the recession basically ended, 2008 to 2010, the number of jobs stayed almost exactly the same. It went up and back a little bit, and then beginning in 2010, it started to explode again. Plus, you're going to make at least a million dollars more over your lifetime, which means that unless you have, well, I know some people carry hundreds of thousands of dollars of student debt, but even still, you're going to be able to pay that off easier than you would have had you not yeah, made so, that investment. So if you go to medical school and you borrow a couple hundred thousand dollars, you'll pay that off um, a lot more rapidly than if you if you go to a really expensive um, place and get a degree in um, a less remunerative career. But we took we took this data for Southern Utah University, and admittedly, um, Utah has a lower tuition than most states. We we, in fact, have the fourth lowest tuition of all the states in the country. Um, that's because the legislature has been generous and are still contributing at high rates for us to help us along and keep the tuition down. If you look at Southern Utah University, 
um, we charted this out. We said, okay, let's assume that one person graduates from high school and goes out and just gets the best job he can. Um, how much is he going to make? And then how much is he going to make year after year after year with inflation? And then we took the second person and said, okay, the second person is going to graduate from high school, go to college. Um, and so for four years, the second person will not be making any money. In fact, will be borrowing money. Um, and then upon graduation, goes out within a few months and starts a job. How many years does it take for that person to catch up? How many? Seven. Wow. So seven years is all it takes for it to be a positive return on investment. Seven years. That's not very long. We're going to work for a long, long time. Now, if you go to a very expensive private school, and depending on your major and depending on where you choose to go work, it'll take longer to get that return on investment. But remember, the average is a million dollars more over a lifetime and so even if you have to borrow 50000 or $100,000, you're going to make that back. The cost of tuition fees and books at Southern Utah University is less than a basic pickup truck. Brand new, without any extras. Even though both of us, I think, would agree that higher education is probably too expensive, and it's one of the things that we talk about all the time in cabinet and uh, and all the other various leadership uh, gatherings that, that you host and you're engaged with. Um, at Southern Utah University, a college degree still remains a great investment. It's still very affordable. It's, uh, I, I, meet, I meet with high school students every year uh, in an assembly type format and talk to them about um, going to college and why they should consider it. And we, we explore a lot of things for a better part of an hour. But the cost of going to Southern Utah University is less than the cost of buying a brand new pickup truck. That's uh... And when you've got the pickup truck, um, four years later, you know, it's worth less. And four years after you've started your college degree, it's worth more. And, and the value keeps going up for your whole life. It's... Um, we are doing everything we can to keep costs low. And uh, the investment for students is fantastic. It's fantastic return on investment. So wait to buy that pickup truck. That's the message. That's right. Invest first and then get the truck later. And get the truck later. So during our season one, the date came by that was marking the 50th anniversary of the assassination of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. And we invited our uh, assistant to the president for diversity and inclusion, Dr. Shavala Rivera, to join us to talk about Dr. King's legacy. Yeah, and, and um, what a terrific, what a terrific person. He's an example of so many wonderful people in this country that that have flaws but helped move us to a much 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 better place um, he I, I put him in the top list of of all the famous Americans that have ever lived he's he's right there in the top group for yeah. me he's at a Mount Rushmore yeah, yeah. kind of a figure for sure mm-hmm this is our discussion, uh, our discussion from episode 17 in season one with Dr. Shivala Rivera on the legacy of Martin Luther King. And then it was about at 18 that he wrote one of the really impressive pieces of his life, which was um, uh, a speech on the purpose of education. Yes. Would you like to? Yeah. And if I, that? if um, I really like this, uh, he wrote this to the student newspaper and in that he he wrote that the purpose of a true education is intelligence plus character. And, and he spent a bit of time talking about how education has two purposes. One is, is a, a utilitarian purpose, which is preparing us for careers. And then the other purpose is um, to develop character. He referred to it as culture and, mm -hmm. 
And uh, we can be very intelligent and do a lot of harm in the world. Yes, yes. Um, he spoke a lot about um, sincere ignorance, and he also said conscientious stupidity. Those are very <laughs> dangerous. He said those are uh, two dangerous things in the world is sincere ignorance and conscientious stupidity. One we can work with. Um, sincere ignorance is just you don't know what you don't know. And that's just the basic meaning of ignorance. But when it comes from a place of sincerity, usually people are willing to talk and engage or at least consider something else. But conscientious stupidity means that you're making a decision to live in error or to believe untruths or misinformation. So that's very dangerous. I think we see a lot of that. That's very fitting for our current climate as well. Yeah, and if we if we look at our role in education, uh, we shouldn't ever feel badly when someone comes to a university um, sincerely ignorant. Mm -hmm. In fact, we want to fill our buildings with those kind of people. Yes, that's the that's our goal, right? Is to educate, mm -hmm. and we want mm -hmm. people to come that need educating. <laughs> yes. Open minds and open hearts. Those are what we need. You know, we're all ignorant about something. We don't we don't know everything. But if we approach everything with sincerity, then we can hopefully humbly come to knowledge, which is the goal of education. Yeah. So he wrote this uh, article to his uh, university student newspaper in 1947. And it's a great read. I think everyone ought to, everyone in higher education should read this. The, the dual purpose of both utility and culture, helping us prepare. And then there's some other, if we move further into his life, there's some other really neat um, addresses that he's made mm -hmm. or messages that he's left for our day. Uh, definitely. I love, I spoke a little bit um, at our past MLK celebration we had on campus. Um, one of his quotes was, let us develop a kind of dangerous unselfishness. And that means that we give to each other <clears throat> and we set aside our personal needs for the, for, the, um, for the needs of the community and we come together. So a little bit of that um, willingness to give is very important. So that's a that's a quote that I yeah, those, I love, you know. Those are interesting words put together. Dangerous and unselfishness. <laughs> it's like <laughs> you know, when I first read that I thought, oh wow, you know, dangerously unselfish, you know, and just rolling that around in my mind and it and it can be, especially when we live in a society that tells you that you need more. More is better. That's actually one of my favorite episodes. I love the discussion about um, not only the article that he wrote for the student newspaper when he was very young. He was, <laughs> what, 15 years old or something, 16 <laughs> right. years old when he started the university. But but um, it just it, he was such a compelling figure in terms of, as you suggested, moving America to a better place. That's right. And we still need people like him. We still need people like Martin Luther King and Abraham Lincoln and a long list of people. We need we need them today. Yeah. I love the quote about developing dangerous unselfishness. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think that's a, uh, when you when you really think about what that would mean. Uh, if we were all dangerously unselfish towards one another, it would be a much better place to live. Yeah, and when I was a college student, I met his widow, Coretta Scott King. And I remember thinking then, and I, I think more so today, what would it be like to be married to somebody that's living such a dangerous life um, for the good of everybody else, but certainly not for the good of your family? That's right. Because that was a very scary time for them. A remarkable sacrifice um, by both Dr. King and his family. You've been listening to Solutions for Higher Education, a podcast featuring Scott L. Wyatt, the president of Southern Utah University in Cedar City, Utah. We thank you for listening, our devoted listeners, and we'll be back again with another run of brand new 
podcasts very soon. Thanks for listening. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to Solutions for Higher Education. To subscribe to this podcast, please visit www.suu.edu forward slash President's Podcast, where you will find both the audio and a written transcript of today's podcast. The original music for this podcast was composed by Jack Barton, a master's degree student in music technology at SUU. For more information about Southern Utah University, please visit www.suu.edu.